the stuff orders. And these are perhaps the two best books you can find on it. Again, they're very short. They have excellent photographs, full color plates. This guy, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Deadliest Warrior series on Spike TV. Yeah. This guy was an expert on it. He came in for Genghis Khan, I think, if you want to YouTube him. He's a professor out of Georgia, and Eric Hildinger, he is actually a law professor now out of Michigan. Excellent books. And if you're interested in any of these books on a more surface level, I've written reviews for all of them. You can Google it if you want. Here's a map of Central Asia. I don't know if you guys can see this, but you can actually see the distinctions that they make between the different types of little Mongol empires within it. You get like the golden, golden horde over here, and you have the Okan and things like this. They're all part of the Mongol Empire, but they did make distinctions. I think this is a little bit better image. This is where most of them originated from, right here. The step warriors were nomads, and they migrated with, with frequent regularity. I think they were so successful because of the environment that they did live in. They were tough, they were very resilient, and they were lightning on horseback. I cannot even emphasize that enough. In their campaigns against the southern, uh, in southern Russia, they would fight in wintertime. They would do things that the Russians would never do. They could actually cover over 100 miles in a day. 100 miles in a day. And you got to think about even doing half that. Carrying all your, your livelihood with you, they carried everything with them. So it's like having a hundred pound pack on your back, you know, have your whole livelihood with you. You move a hundred miles in a day. It was impressive. And the fact that they could, you know, you could literally look out one morning from a mountaintop and see nothing, and then the next morning have, you know, thousands of these guys, you know, surrounding you was, it inspired a lot of awe. And this comes into a point where we like to call calculated terror that they would use. So they were a product of a harsh environment. They were hardened by their environment, and they were probably the most frightening group of people you'd ever want to, you know, cross eyes with. Their tactics. As you'll see when we go through this, they are very different from the Western concept of how war should be fought. It's the complete antithesis. It's a complete 180. They avoided direct confrontations. When fighting Western armies, especially during the Crusades, this one tactic decimated the Crusader armies with relative ease. What they would do, they would go out as if they were going to meet them, they would turn around and they would run. Western armies go, ha ha, we got these guys. They go after them. Day after day, they would see them get a little close, they'd go further away. A little close, they go further away. Dr. Craig's very familiar with this because he teaches on the Crusades. This is a tactic that they used during the Crusades in, in Turkey. Oh, they had told him. And a lot of the Crusader armies were thinned out to such a point that it was pathetic. Just through this one tactic. They would, they would avoid direct confrontations and they would feign retreat. They get to the point where they were so exhausted and tired that they would just pick them off. It's highly effective. Feign retreats. This strategy worked great in conjunction with avoiding pitched engagements against Western armies and often resulted in a protracted chase. Some of these would last for days. Oftentimes they would actually send out small parties to engage a Western army or Crusade army. They would drag them out only to draw them to the large step warrior army. And then they would just completely obliterate them. Another tactic that they would use would be encirclement. And of course, because of how fast they were on horseback, this was easily done. And again, highly effective. When you take these all together, I mean, it was almost perfect. I use the word dominance because that's exactly what they were. When you look at the Mongols and you look at Tamerlane in the 13th and 14th centuries, these guys were impressive. Tamerlane was not even a military guy. He was a bureaucrat. He was a pencil pusher. He was highly effective as a, as a general. He actually, I think it was in Syria, I'm not, I'm not very sure, he actually erected a monument that was quite impressive, just the uh, enemy skulls. So feared that he was that people would open up their gates and just let him in. So we, we're not, we don't want to fight you, we don't want to be obliterated. 
calculated terror is exactly what they used, and they used it with great effect. They were unpredictable. They had large numbers. They almost had a limitless supply of people that they can keep, you know, filling the ranks. People were highly, highly afraid. Just the thought of hearing it. But Genghis Khan is the one who actually set the tone. After him, everybody came after him. He already, already left an impression. So anytime they heard they were coming, you know, just open the gates, let them in. We don't want to, we don't want to even mess with them. They were highly organized. A lot of people know that. They were highly organized as a military unit. But when it comes to political, they had no political uh, solidarity whatsoever, no organization, no government. There's nothing centralized about them. This was Tamerlane's probably greatest failing. He amassed such a massive empire, only to lose it within a generation of death because of the political fragmentation. And that concludes my presentation, guys. I hope that you were able to digest a thousand years of <laughs> military history without getting ahead. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. for my asking questions. If you have any questions or anything, please. Sure. So who came up with the phrase Byzantine? It was actually a guy named Hieronymus Wolf. He was a German writer. And a lot of people think he was just sort of like a German nationalist, egotistical type of thing, trying to give them like a Machiavellian type of thing. When you hear Machiavelli, you go, that doesn't sound good. Well, actually, in actuality, you know, it's just a pejorative label that we attach to it. There's nothing wrong with being called Machiavellian if you actually understand the, the life and times of Machiavelli. He was actually exiled from his uh, beloved city of Florence and died in exile. But here, we, you know, we revere him now. We just call power politics. Same thing with us. Byzantine was not a bad name, nothing of the sort. They're actually very exceptional. Anybody else? Um, I know a lot of people say that the Romans would force, like if they conquered someone they didn't come out, they would force their sons fight for them mm -hmm. and without pay, is that true? Or? Without pay? Um, oftentimes it was them or just the threat of it oftentimes would alleviate it. Not that these things did not happen, I'm not saying that. I mean, the Roman military system was harsh, not only to their enemies, but to, the, to each other. There's actually a, an excellent series, it's just called Rome. Uh, it was made in Europe and it's a two part, it's a two season series and it chronicles a centurion and a regular soldier and kind of the jury together. The fact is though, even though it's very gruesome, very realistic, it's actually very faithful to how things operated back then. And if you actually you actually want to see how this kind of thing operated on a day-to-day -day basis, I would suggest that you read that because it is amazing and it's very entertaining. Normally Romans would not want somebody in the army that they were enemies. Yeah. You can't rely upon slaves. You can't rely upon enemies, so the priests would never do that. It would take hostages of families that they yeah. wanted to influence, but uh, I don't think, like, they would take my son as a hostage and have me fight for them. You know, still, they don't think they trust them too much. That's actually a very common practice. I don't know how familiar you guys are with the fall of Rome, but like the name Attila and Alaric and names like this. Uh, you have a guy named Aetius, who was actually, it was very common with aristocratic families to send your son to this barbarian chief for X number of years as a hostage, or as a guest, you know, they call them guests, to ensure that, you know, you weren't going to do this, you weren't going to betray us, you weren't going to break allegiance, blah, blah, blah. This is very common in the third and fourth centuries. And this is also why he was probably the right general to fight against Attila because he was actually one of those hostages for many years. So he knew them as good as anybody could, knew their language, knew their customs. So that was more common. But on a general basis, as Dr. Craig said, what would be the utility of it? It's one more person you have to worry about, especially within, that's the last thing they did. Yes? Um, you mentioned the difference between the Roman strategy, grand strategy, the Byzantine grand strategy, you know, annihilation versus making alliances. Um, I guess, to what extent does that have to do with the Roman Empire, its sort of strategy for expansion, whereas the Byzantines, it's defensive, they're kind of contracting? The Romans, it was kind of like their manifest destiny with America. They wanted to expand and expand and expand. It was, it was almost like an ego thing. And the, the empire was everything for Byzantium. They, they just wanted to survive. It was a whole different mentality. You would think that they would probably have shared more of that ancient heritage with the, the actual Western Romans, but they didn't. 
and I think it was just a matter of necessity. You know, they just wanted to continue living, coexist peacefully. I mean, you can't fight. I mean, they had dozens of enemies in every direction. One was, you know, assuaged, and then another one would pop up. You can't continue at any pace like this without exhausting the resources that you have, and then the people uprising against you. So you had to really keep your ear to the ground. Because if one contingent came up against you, you're extremely weak. If you have two come up against you, you can easily be broken. And a lot of the people would influence this from within. They wanted to see this kind of thing happen so that they could take power over. There's a lot of internal dissension, not just in Western Europe. I mean, in any type of empire you have this, you have people who want to take advantage of the situation. And this is very common. That's why those foreign mercenaries were brought in. They couldn't rely on their own people. I mean, the people who they trusted most were the ones who could, you know, bring about their demise. And that was actually very common, especially in the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. Any other questions? It could be about anything. I'll do my best if I can answer. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Can I get a copy of the PowerPoint? Yeah, if you have a thing. I mean, if you hear, yeah, 